All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Jen Weiss. I'm a senior policy associate at the Nicholas Institute, and I have had the pleasure of working with many of you on the South Carolina Energy Efficiency Roadmap. I'm really looking forward to all the recommendations that are coming out of this process. And one of the things that we've been focusing on is, uh, is education and awareness about energy efficiency. I've heard loud and clear from a lot of you that you want to learn more about the current utility energy efficiency programs, their utility business models, um, and maybe get a peek into what they're thinking about doing next. And so um, I am really excited about today's webinar. We've put together uh, this all-star utility team to talk more about their, their programs, their business model, and other interesting tidbits. So without further ado, Here's our agenda for the next two hours. I know it's a little bit long, but um, we really wanted to get all of the utilities involved um, and we wanted to get all of your questions answered. Um, so hang in with us. I know it's gonna be a lot of fun. You're gonna learn a lot. Um, so the agenda today, um, once I get through my little talk, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the South Carolina utility landscape. We're gonna dive into the IOU energy efficiency programs. Um, the Santa Cooper Energy Efficiency Programs, um, Electric Cooperatives, and Municipal um, Programs. And then at the end, we'll do a, a Q&A um, for any questions that were not answered um, by, um, by all of our speakers. And we'll conclude at 11 o'clock. Um, the webinar will be recorded, and I will send the slides out to everyone, so um, you will all have those. Um, but please feel free as we're going through this. Um, there's a lot of people on this call, so I'm going to keep your lines muted except for the speakers. But if you have a question that you want answered, um, if you could use the chat feature, it's up in the, um, the bar above in a little drop down menu and just send a chat to me with your question and I'll make sure it gets asked at the end. Um, so um, thank you all for joining us. I wanted to quickly introduce the speakers. Um, besides myself from the Nicholas Institute, we have Catherine Reed and Stacy Washington from the Energy Office from um, the Office of Regulatory Staff. We have Therese Griffin and Cheryl Shelton from Dominion Energy. We have Tim Duff and Linda Schaefer from Duke Energy. We have Jim Raven from Santee Cooper. We have Mike Smith from Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina and Eric Budd from the Municipal Association of South Carolina. So you can see an all-star staff that is going to do their best to answer all of your questions today. So I really want to thank the speakers for their time this morning and for the information and for all of you for joining us. Going to turn it now over to Catherine Reed and Stacy Washington from the Energy Office to give us a little bit more information about the general utility landscape in South Carolina. Thank you, Jen. This is Catherine Reed, um, and um, we're so happy to be part of this today. And thanks for for all of you um, for participating as speakers and as as participants. Um, Actually, Stacey Washington um, in our office is going to start off for our little overview presentation. Ours is quite brief. Uh, we just wanted to provide a big picture snapshot of what the landscape looks like. So Stacey will begin, I'll chime in, and then we'll hand it off to our, our real experts. <laughs> so Stacey, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Stacey Washington in the Energy Office. Um, we're going to start off with just a little bit of data on the energy um, landscape in South Carolina. I do want to mention that all of this data is available on our website. If you go to um, SC Energy Data there and click on electric, that's where all of this information is housed. Next slide. So first we're just going to look at the generation mix in South Carolina. Um, as you can see, the, the one on the left is actually what's generated um, in South Carolina, so we have um, nuclear there and coal as the big ones, um, and then we have the per rata share on the right-hand side, and this incorporates um, Duke Energy's um, North Carolina and South Carolina assets, so this information is just the assets from the utilities, um, so you, you know, a lot of people comment on the solar and it being smaller, but this does not include residential um, solar, this is just the utility assets that are presented here. Um, and for those who do not know what pro rata share is, um, that is looking at North Carolina and South Carolina assets for Duke, um, for energy and pro Carolina's in progress. They have uh, incorporated a share of their North Carolina assets with us. So 15% of their of Duke progress's share is attributed, attributed to South Carolina, and 27% of Duke Carolina's share is South Carolina. Next slide. 
Um, this is just looking at the utilities in South Carolina um, in the different categories. So we have four investor-owned utilities, Duke Carolina, Duke Progress, Lockhart, and uh, Dominion. We have the state-owned utility, St. Pete Cooper, the municipalities. We have 21 municipalities and 20 electric cooperatives for 46 utilities in the state. Um, the percentage is there. 59% of the customers are from investor-owned, and then we have 7% from Safety Cooper, 6% with the munis, and 29% with the co-op. Next slide. Um, this just gives you a look at the territory in South Carolina, just to give you an idea of the spider web of the territory. So, you know, this helps you understand that why somebody down the street may have a, um, different incentives, um, since we're talking about energy efficiency, somebody, especially, for example, in Eastover, people in the county in Eastover or Tri-County, and they have the incentives for that co-op, for, for that utility. And then the people in the town have dominion, and they have those um, different incentives that they can take advantage of. So just down the street, can, there can be different things that you can um, take advantage of. So the dark blue at the top is Duke Carolina's. The tan in the eastern part of the state is Progress. The dark green in that eastern part is Sinti Cooper. The brown is Sinti Electric Cooperative over there with Sinti Cooper. So I wanted to give you an idea of the different look. And then Dominion is that in the Midlands to the Low Country is that light blue color. So you can just see, we talk about the IOUs and, and their territories, but there's a spider web of co-ops mixed in there. Um, this does not include the municipalities of Lockhart, though. So even then, there's even more of a spider web if you include um, those utility territories as well. Next slide. And then just this looks at the customers and the breakdown by utility. Um, the industrial cooperatives together have the most uh, customers in the state, 800,000, followed closely by Dominion, a little over 700,000. Um, then we have Duke Carolinas at almost 700,000 and Duke Progress there at 226. So um, this just gives you an idea of who has the most customers. Next slide. Okay, so this is Catherine. Thank you, Stacey, for that overview. Um, and I really think that the most um, sort of illustrative slide um, is that is that map, the territory map. And, and, no, and noting that, as she said, it doesn't include the municipalities or Lockhart, then you realize how complex a landscape we really do work in. So um, I just wanted to, um, I don't want to be duplicative of our, our speakers who are, who are going to be coming up and um, following our presentation, but we just wanted to provide sort of a big picture, high level snapshot of the utility landscape. So I'm just going to touch on some of the things, the different categories of utilities we have. And um, so first of all, as Stacey mentioned, we've got four investor and utilities, Dominion, Duke Energy Progress, Duke Energy Carolinas, and Lockhart Power. And these are all regulated by the Public Service Commission. Um, next slide, please. So we have one public utility in the state, and that is Santee Cooper, which is also, you'll, you'll sometimes hear it referred to as the South Carolina Public Service Authority in some settings. So, um, and of course, that's been in the news a lot lately. Um, not regulated by the Public Service Commission, and it is it has a governing board that approves programs and rates, and I know Jim will be talking about that, uh, about more details uh, shortly. And just as an, another overview, the board candidates are appointed by the governor, they are reviewed by the Public Utilities Review Committee, and they're confirmed by the Senate. Next slide, please. Okay, so the electric cooperatives, there are 20 in South Carolina, and you might hear the term, they're member-owned, um, which basically means they're consumer-owned. Um, and I know Mike Smith will be, will be giving a more detailed overview, but just wanted to just paint the larger picture that they're not regulated, not regulated by the Public Service Commission, there's a board that governor, governs and approves programs and rates, and the consumers or the members elect the board. Um, there are some responsibilities through the Energy Freedom Act, Act 62, that do give the Office of Regulatory Staff some responsibilities regarding the electric co-op, which is kind of a new thing, but um, there's probably no need to get into it here. Um, and Mike will give a greater de go into greater detail, of course, about the, the details about the electric cooperatives and the role of both Central Electric and the um, electric co-ops of South Carolina. And then moving on, uh, municipal electric utilities. So there are 21 municipal electric utilities in South Carolina, also 
these are not regulated by the Public Service Commission. Uh, each municipality govern, governs and approves programs and rates, and um, they're represented through the Municipal Association of South Carolina and the Association of Municipal Power Systems. Um, I don't want to misrepresent the role of, of this entity, so I'm going to let Eric take that, but I wanted just to um, make sure you all see that is really at a snapshot what the landscape look, what looks like, how many different player, big players there are. Um, and last but not least, I do want to provide an, some information about the Office of Regulatory Staff. So the next slide. Um, thank you. So I know most of you already know this. So the Energy Office is housed within the Office of Regulatory Staff. Um, so the larger agency in which we, are, we operate is a regulatory agency, and we, our mission is to represent the consumers and investor-owned utilities before the Public Service Commission, so all the IOUs that I mentioned earlier. Um, and just to give you some flavor about this, this includes electric, but it also includes natural gas, transportation, water and wastewater, and telecommunication utilities. Um, we have various departments, which I think also will help give, give you an understanding of, of the reach of Office of Regulatory Staff or the responsibilities. We have a Consumer Services Department, which is basically set up to serve as a neutral mediator uh, with between consumers and utilities if there are any issues that need to go beyond, beyond the, the direct uh, consumer and utility um, discussions. We also have a safety group that focuses on railroad safety, natural gas pipeline, fuel supply, and coordinates with the emergency management department. We have, um, our, we also have oversight over transportation. So there's regulation of taxis, Uber, Lyft, charter buses, and limos. That's a, an ever-changing la landscape, as you can imagine, with um, with the new share, shared um, economy. Um, telecommunications as well. They do um, our our agency does oversee the Universal Service Fund, which basically provides phone access to hearing and speech impaired and provides other services as well. Um, so then there's the energy office and we don't fit as neatly in to that. Um, we, we, ha we actually don't have any kind of regulatory authority. We are, um, and I know we say, you hear us saying that a lot, but just to remind you all of our role, you know what we do in terms of the energy efficiency roadmap, but for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our other activities, in addition to implementing the state energy plan, of which this energy efficiency roadmap is a part. Um, we provide technical assistance in terms of energy assessments and training. We provide financial assistance in terms of loans and grants. And we do a great deal of out education and outreach ranging from just the general public to, um, to also K through 12. And we maintain energy data, which uh, I know Stacy pointed out some of the, the, the results of uh, some of the work we do. So that's just the big picture. So you can see um, the Office of Regulatory Staff is definitely involved in some of the discussions, uh, the work of the investor and utility, less so with the others. But the Energy Office, um, we try to touch all the parts of the spider web. <laughs> and uh, in some way or form or fashion, and I know this energy efficiency roadmap is really um, key to trying to look at the entire state, uh, regardless of who touches what consumer and try to pull it together and come up with a, a plan for the future. So um, we're really thrilled to, to have this and we look forward to learning from all of the experts. Thanks to all of the, the speakers who are going to follow us. Um, but I guess that is it for us now. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Catherine and Stacy, for that wonderful overview. Um, we're going to jump right into the next um, group of, of, of speakers. Um, from Dominion Energy, we have Therese Griffin and Cheryl Shelton. And Therese and Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jen, and good morning, everyone. I just wanted to also add that Ginger Greenway is with us as well. She's a manager in our demand side management uh, department. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I wanted to give everyone sort of a level set on the programs and the history of the programs. There are a few things I want to point out on this slide. In 2009, the programs were initiated through a potential study. We recommended to the commission a portfolio of programs that was approved, and we began implementation in 2010. So now here in 2020, we're in program year 10, 
and you will hear us often describe the, the activities of the programs based on the program years. As a part of the orders and the approval that the Commission has given us to run these programs, there includes several provisions. One of them is an opt-out provision that industrial customers um, have. So the largest industrial customers on our system have the option to opt out, and most of them have done so. Another provision of the orders to implement the programs includes um, the establishment of an energy efficiency advisory group. So we have about a dozen folks who meet with us three times a year to review the programs and give their input. Many of those participants are interveners in our annual case before the commission, and we have conversations about what's going on in the program, what they recommend, and, and what we have done to improve the program. The other provision within the orders um, to run the programs deals with evaluation. So as an IOU, uh, we are not e evaluating the programs on our own. The programs must be evaluated by a third party. We use a company called Opinion Dynamics Corporation to evaluate our program. And so they go through a process that we refer to as evaluation, measurement, and verification. And that happens on an annual basis. We file a report with the commission on our EMNV annually in May. Additionally, we are required to provide the commission with updates annually in terms of what's going on with our programs. And we also petition for increases in the DSM rider. That happens every January. So on January 31st, we filed with the commission an update on our program. So we gave a status of the programs. Um, we talked about potential changes to the program that we are requesting. And then we also uh, made a recommendation for the rider. We'll go to the next slide. This is how we recover the costs related to the energy efficiency portfolio that we manage. There are program costs. Those costs are amortized over five years. There are net loss revenues from the, the lost energy on the system. And then there's a shared savings incentive. Previously, our shared savings was at 6%. So this is how we earn on the programs in addition to collecting the lost revenues. And um, going forward, our shared savings will be 9.9%. Uh, the rates are determined by rate class. So we have residential rates. We have small general service, medium general service, and large general service. Right now, the DSM rider is at $1.84, um, and it is baked into the base rate for electric customers, and we are recommending a $0.36 cent increase as a result of the potential study that we just completed, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. If you go to the next slide, um, it gives you a, uh, a little bit idea of how we conduct uh, EMNV working with the third party um, evaluator. So six months after the end of each program year, we file with the commission. Um, we're in PY10 now, so we will file a report based on PY9, so the previous year, this coming May. Um, the first order requires a third party evaluation, as I mentioned previously. Um, we follow the annual portfolio EMV report. There's also individual program guidance reports. These program guidance reports are used to improve the programs annually. So the evaluator might specifically say, here are some things that you can do to improve the program by increasing energy savings. And we review those with the advisory group and implement those on an annual basis. In general, when looking at the total budget for the programs, three to 5% of the total budget is spent on evaluation. Uh, we determine the level of evaluation by program based on the contribution of energy savings uh, to the portfolio. So CNI programs receive the most um, oversight or evaluation and the low income program receives the least evaluation. Next slide. 
So this is a summary look at the performance of the Dominion portfolio uh, since its inception and through November 2018. And so you can see um, HEC is the home energy checkup program that we have. We've had over 21,000 visits there. This is a residential audit program. We've had over 48,000 heating and cooling rebates issued. Um, and our average issue time is four weeks for processing. Uh, we generally hang out around the two to three week period. Um, we've had over 10,000 appliances recycled through the program. That's refrigerators and freezers. Of the $113 million that we've invested, um, 72 million or 64% have been customer rebates. Um, in PY8, it was actually 73%. So we look at the budget in terms of how much of the spend goes back to customers in the form of incentives or rebates and how much is used to administer the program. And so we wanna keep the, the non-incentive costs as low as possible. And then on the right is a infographic that Opinion Dynamics prepares for us annually that just summarizes the overall impact. So you can see 145,000 customers have been engaged, over 7,000 businesses, almost 12,000 low-income customers, and the bulb, um, so the bulb sales have been big in the program. Uh, we previously had a retail program, and now we have an online store, and so we've um, sold 7.7 million bulbs. On the right of that infographic, it tells you about the kilowatt hours that have been saved, and then it, it, it equates those kilowatt hours to the impact on the system. And then the bottom is just all the forms of outreach that we use, and they, they are more numerous than what you see there, but that's the summary. You can go to the next slide. These are the programs as they existed prior to the recent order that we received. So I mentioned that we conducted a potential study in 2009. We initiated another potential study in 2018, and we reported out to the commission on the results of that study in 2019. And so these are the programs that we have run for the past, I guess, six years. These programs have been in effect as a result of the potential study, which a potential study looks at all of the opportunity for energy efficiency within our service area. And then we look at, based on the, the technical and economic opportunity, we determine what's achievable. And so based on the potential study, all of the programs that were previously run passed cost effectiveness testing and were determined to be um, achievable. So all of our prior programs will continue under the new portfolio. So the new portfolio began on December 1st of 2019, and all of these programs have continued. And I'm gonna go through them very briefly and give you a high level summary. The home energy checkup program, as I mentioned previously, is a residential energy audit. It's a visual audit. Uh, we spend about an hour or so with customers going through all of the key elements of, um, that affect their bill in the home. It's it's, we, we tend to look at our programs based on um, incentives, education, and, and whether or not we are actually on site. And so that's what you see there on the, on the right. The heating and cooling program and ductwork program, um, these are rebates that we offer for energy efficiency equipment that is installed. The neighborhood energy efficiency program is our low income program. We do what's called direct installation of energy efficiency measures into the homes of these customers at no cost to the customers. And so that's done through a concerted effort, working with folks in the community, usually with the city council and the mayor, as well as social services agencies, the community action agencies. Um, so we go into those communities and uh, we're serving anywhere from you know, 1,000 to 1,500 homes at a time. The Home Energy Report Program is a residential benchmarking program. Through this program, customers are able to receive reports either monthly or bimonthly that tell them how they are performing in terms of their energy usage compared to like customers. So it gives you a report that your energy usage was here and your, your neighbors or like customers 
um, had a, a certain energy usage, and it's, so it, you get to see how you're doing against your neighbors. Um, you are also able to set goals for yourself um, in terms of your energy usage. That report tells you how you're doing against your goal as well. And you can receive it through the mail or electronically. The appliance recycling program, uh, we will pick up at no cost. Um, refriger refrigerators and freezers that meet the qualifications, um, and we will give customers a $50 rebate for that program for each appliance. The EnergyWise Savings Store is the online marketplace. It focuses on lighting, um, but we have also added water conservation products. Um, we have a smart uh, thermostat and some other um, energy efficiency products out there. Through the new portfolio, the um, smart thermostats were added uh, and will continue on the site. The CNI programs, commercial and industrial programs, are the energy wise for your business. This is for large industrial customers and uh, large commercial customers. And then the small business energy solutions program really focuses on the smallest non residential customers. You can go to the next slide. So this is the expanded programs as a result of the potential study. And through the potential study, we are doubling uh, the programs. The doubling effect um, is in the spend as well as in the energy savings that we anticipate capturing. Uh, all of the programs are expanded. And when I say expanded, I'm, I'm talking about expanded participation and increased energy savings. So the appliance recycling program will have more aggressive goals. The heating and cooling program will issue more um, rebates and higher incentives um, in those rebates. Um, we have added the measure of electric resistance heat to air source heat pumps. Um, we, we previously did not have that as an option and we will have it. And we have also added heat pump water heaters to this program. The home energy program, home energy checkup program will continue as it has. Um, the current version of that program is what we will refer to as tier one. Um, under tier two, this new effort, we will look at directly installing measures that focus more on the, the building envelope of the home. And those measures will be paid at 75% of the cost the customer will contribute 25% to the installation of those measures. So we will work directly with um, contractors to install those measures. The Home Energy Reports Program, currently our program is an opt-in program. So we invite customers to participate. Um, if they agree, they begin to receive the reports. We will be transitioning to an opt-out model by 2023. And through the opt-out model, we will identify the highest energy users um, and we will invite them to participate. We will actually opt them in to participation. Um, and if they don't want to stay in the program, they'll have to opt themselves out. Right now, we have about 40,000 customers participating in the home energy reports. Um, that will, will double, um, more than double as we go through the next five years. The Neighborhood Energy Efficiency Program, we will expand, greatly expand participation in that program. The Energy Wise Savings Store, we've added the smart thermostats. We went ahead and added those thermostats um, over the Thanksgiving um, sales weekend, and um, they continue there. Uh, the Multifamily Program, this is a new program, um, and we have we have served multifamily through the other programs, but this is the first time that we've set aside multifamily um, within the portfolio. And so it will, there will be a, an incentive or a rebate or direct installation within the units of these apartments. Um, and then we will also have the direct installation of um, measures within the common areas and and that will be a shared cost within the common areas within the units there will be no cost to those customers the energy wise for your business program we are adding um, an agricultural offering all of the measures that are currently in the program are available to our agricultural customers 
but we will have a more focused effort around serving uh, this customer group. And throughout the Energy Wise for Your Business program, we will expand and increase the incentives um, for lighting and other end uses. We are also adding a component um, uh, commonly referred to as strategic energy management to this program. And SEM involves a sort of longer term relationship uh, with customers in managing their, their on-site energy usage. So we're looking for non-residential customers who may not have access to an on-site energy manager like many of our large industrial customers do. So we'll work with those customers to identify what um, their existing systems, how their existing systems are functioning, and we'll work with them on improvements to increase energy savings. The Small Business Direct Install Program, um, we will continue with higher incentives and we will expand the participation. And then lastly, uh, we have two new programs, one residential and one um, non-residential. The non-residential program is the Municipal LED Lighting. Um, this is a new program that actually Cheryl will be managing um, where, where we will upfit lighting in, in municipalities within our service area at, at no cost. So the cost will be neutral um, to our customers um, and the cost will be recovered through the DSM rider. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so there were, I think there was a question about non-energy benefits, and these last few slides we've attempted to answer some of the questions that came in last week. Um, we do include, or we did in this go-round of our potential study, we did include non-energy benefits. We did not include them in the first study um, that was conducted back in 2009. So we looked at um, savings from water and wastewater, natural gas, and then we looked at also um, avoided or deferred equipment replacement costs, and all those um, benefits were added into the TRC, which is the total resource cost, which is the, the cost effectiveness mechanism that we use to evaluate the program. We can go to the next slide. Um, so Jen asked us to talk a little bit about some of the challenges, challenges and constraints of operating the portfolio. Um, obviously, the industrial opt-out eliminates a, a huge uh, segment of our customer base um, that participate in the programs. Um, when we are looking at cost effectiveness, avoided costs, these are the costs that we avoid on the system as a result of the programs. Um, those costs have been declining, so um, they were fairly high when we initiated these programs back in 2009 and they have declined, which has challenged us on cost effectiveness. And that is where, honestly, the, the non-energy benefits have helped our portfolio by factoring in those savings that customers are realizing with water and gas um, and equipment that has helped us um, with cost effectiveness across the portfolio. Um, appliance standards are changing, so uh, lighting standards are higher. Um, uh, standards with um, HVAC units are higher and, and increasing, and so that challenges us on finding energy savings. Um, EM&V, um, the process of evaluation that the IOUs have to go through, um, can impact um, our ability to capture energy savings. So there is uh, something called net to gross that the evaluator looks at within the program, and it essentially takes so you look at all the gross savings that you get from the program, and then the evaluator goes in and de tries to determine, you know, to what degree did these programs actually influence customers? So there's conservation that happens on the system where customers are making decisions in independently, and then there's how much the, did the DSM programs actually influence those customers? And so for each measure, um, they are evaluating, you know, that influence. And so the net to gross can negatively impact some of those measures and, and as a result, some of the programs. So consumer behavior is a huge factor in running these programs. Um, you know, we can lay out what we think will happen in the home or in the business, but ultimately customers are deciding on the comfort level that they prefer in their home or business 
um, and they are making decisions independently of any messaging that we might be giving them. So that is something that education is a constant um, within all of the programs. We're constantly trying to educate customers on how to optimize the energy usage in the home. Then we have a couple of segments of hard to reach customers. It costs more to reach these customers, uh, low to moderate income customers, small businesses. Um, for low to moderate income customers and small businesses, you know, they are high touch. So we are typically not reaching them through a bill insert or um, a Facebook ad. You know, we, we need to be um, in the community talking to these customers and explaining to them the benefits of the program. And then lastly, you know, awareness and education, as I said earlier, is a constant focus. Um, and, you know, we, we do a lot to get out in the community. We, we do, we participate in literally hundreds of um, community events and activities to talk about energy efficiency, but it's an ongoing challenge. We do measure awareness. Um, within the program every three years. Um, it has increased, um, so we are making strides, but it's just something you have to stay on top of constantly. You can go to the next slide. Um, another question um, that came in last week was around resource planning. Um, there is new legislation in the state that lays out um, some specifics around resource planning. Uh, we don't do resource planning in, on the DSM team, but we do contribute to the plan. And in this um, IRP that will be filed this month, you will see energy efficiency scenarios that are high, medium, and low um, in terms of their contribution to the resource planning. Um, so that is something new um, in the IRP. We do have programs that address peak demand on the system. Um, these programs have been around for a while, the interruptible load, the standby generation. These are mostly large commercial industrial customers that are participating. And then we have time of use programs um, where you are um, incented um, to use energy or to lower your usage um, during peak times of the day. Through the potential study, we evaluated demand response, and so we're looking at opportunities to implement new programs and expand time of use as we go through our advanced meter um, infrastructure upgrades on the system. So we will begin installation of AMI meters on our system um, this spring, um, and it is anticipated to take about three years and um, once that is implemented, we will look to expand some of our demand response programs to specifically address the winter peak. You can go to the next slide. So there was a question about our, our um, conservation rates, and so we wanted to lay those out for everyone. There are two rates um, that are available to residential customers and two that are available to non-residential customers. Um, Rate six um, is, is a program that Ginger's team actually qualifies customers for. It requires an on-site visit um, for us to determine the levels of insulation, um, you know, whether or not you have uh, storm windows, attic ventilation, and that kind of thing. Um, and customers can qualify for that rate. Um, it's about a, is it a cent? Three quarters of a cent. Three quarters of a cent difference. Um, in the standard rate, which is rate eight. And then rate seven is the time of use rate that's available to residential customers. Um, and then we have the two um, rates that are available to non-residential customers. One of the things that I wanted to mention about TOU on the residential side is that it's, it's fairly underutilized. And so we're, we're looking forward to AMI because AMI will allow us to have um, better data to share with the customer um, to incentivize them to uh, participate in time of use. So we are looking forward very much to AMI, not just for time of use, but also for um, the other DSM programs. Go to the next slide. So this is just a summary of the programs um, that we are in process of implementing. So we are going through a process to expand and double the programs 
right now um, we are looking at potentially having new implementers of these programs so we're going through an RFP process we're nego negotiating contracts um, just to make sure they're all up and running um, in a timely manner um, so we went from um, eight programs to ten programs they're all listed here you can see the TRC um, for each of the programs a TRC of one makes it cost-effective um, so you can see that both the residential portfolio and the CNI portfolio are very cost-effective you can see the incentive and non-incentive spend and I talked earlier about us trying to you know keep the non-incentive costs as low as possible so that customers benefit from the incentive portion of our spend and then the megawatt hours the energy savings and the demand savings are there listed at the end this is over a five-year period what you're seeing here this is a summary over a five-year period I think that's the last slide yes it is thank you very much Therese for all of that great information there were a couple of questions that came in I'm going to save them for the end um, okay. but thank you that was very very informative um, I'm going to move along to our other investor-owned utility, uh, Duke Energy, um, and turn it over to Tim Duff and Linda Schaefer. Sure. Well, well, I'll start out. If you can go to the next slide. Um, we're going to go pretty quick because there's a lot of overlap between what the IU, IOU treatment is and our programs, but want to kind of highlight a couple of differences and go into a little bit more detail on a couple things with respect to us. So one of the things I think that we really want to focus on is that we really do believe that part of the reason energy efficiency has been so successful in South Carolina is because of the constructive regulatory mechanisms that the commission has, uh, has approved for us through the company's work with outside stakeholders and the Office of Regulatory Staff to reach a balance that appropriately incentivizes the company. So similar to Dominion, we do our, there are three components that we consider uh, important, cost recovery, which is the recovery of all the costs associated with it. Uh, there is one little unique thing that um, Duke Energy Progress has, which is that it amortizes its program costs versus DEC, which expenses it, which it spreads the costs out, but there is also a return on that unamortized balance of costs. So there's pluses and minuses to both, but I did want to make sure I emphasize that difference. Then there's lost revenue recovery. Lost revenue recovery, we get 36 months. Uh, that wasn't really kind of focused on, but basically we get to recover the impact of the programs that have been determined through M&V for 36 months, not forever. And the 36 months actually can go down if in fact you have a rate case because obviously the impact of the efficiency is being picked up in the change in rates. And so that, that 36 number is a cap, not a is not a, it's not a floor. Um, we, we also basically get to be made whole for the under recovery of fixed costs. That's, that's why you get lost recovery. The fuel wouldn't be consumed, but because rates are based off of a projected volume, when we reduce volume, essentially you're going to under recover your fixed costs. One thing that Duke has, I'm not, I'm not sure about Dominion, is we actually reduce our lost revenues for found revenues meaning if the utility does something that actually increases customer consumption, like adding new outdoor lights, then we would actually reduce the amount of lost revenues to obviously keep that symmetry with customers in terms of the recovery of fixed costs. And then the other key piece is shared savings. Um, and this, we, we really believe shared savings is a key to having utilities aggressively offer energy efficiency because it, it really aligns customers and the company or shareholder interests. Because what it does is it, it really says you're gonna share the net benefit under the utility system cost test, which says what, how does the, the overall utility system benefit from the efficiency and how the overall system benefits, the company gets to keep a percentage of that. So what it really does is it tells the company, you want to get as much energy efficiency as possible, and you want to get it as cost effectively as possible, because that will increase the net benefits to the system, which benefits customers, and then the company gets to keep a small percentage of that net benefit. Next slide, please. So I wanted to kind of walk through the shared savings real quick. Uh, I've kind of talked about it. Essentially, we look at the avoided costs associated with the program. So that's avoided energy, 
avoided capacity and avoided T and D. And then you back out the program costs from that, and that determines the net benefits that customers have realized through the participation in the programs. And then we get a percentage of that. Currently, it's 11.5% for Duke Energy Carolinas and 11.75% for Duke Energy Progress. Next slide, please. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is kind of avoided costs, because it really is the critical piece. And three talked about it a little bit, but the avoided costs for, for the company are really the avoided energy, which means the avoided cost of energy generation, the avoided capacity costs, which means those plants that you don't have to build because of the efficiency, and then the avoided T and D, which means what, what T and D or transmission and distribution investment has to be done to keep up with load growth. So by doing energy efficiency, you're avoiding those. And for, our, for Duke, the shared savings as well as the cost effectiveness only looks at those things. Well, we will, while we will be informed by non-energy benefits, the company has always believed that since these are the benefits that are actually flowing through to customers through electric rates, that those are the benefits that should be looked at when we're determining the cost effectiveness as well as the company's incentive. And that's really important because it keeps that alignment that's so critical for electric customers and for, and for the company in terms of wanting to aggressively adopt energy efficiency. And I think that was my last slide, so I'm gonna turn it over to Linda real quick. All right, so next slide, and let's look at the programs that we have that are no cost to the participants. So these residential programs don't cost anything for customers to participate, although they may be able to um, upgrade if they want to. So the first one is our income qualified programs. This, the neighborhood program is very similar to the ones that Reese described, so I'm not going to repeat that. We also have a weatherization component in our DEC territory that we work through the community action agency. Um, the only difference between our neighborhood program and Dominion's is that we've recently been approved to go back through the neighborhoods, identify some high energy or high, yeah, high energy intense homes and offer um, attic insulation, air sealing, duct sealing, and smart thermostats at no cost to the customer. Um, the home energy house call is just like Dominion's home energy checkup, except again, we were recently approved to offer some upgraded measures. These are measures that a customer can purchase or a blower door test they can um, request and pay to have performed. These measures are purchased at a reduced rate and they don't have to purchase anything. It can be completely free. Um, also, if they purchase the measures at that time, we'll also install them. We have an energy efficiency education program where we go into schools, teach about energy, about conservation, even about renewable energy, and then um, families can have a kit mailed to their home. Our My Home Energy Report is the same benchmarking program that Dominion has, and the multifamily residences, I think um, Therese described their program that was recently approved. Ours is the same thing. We've had it going for quite a while, and it's been very successful. The last um, program you see there is Demand Response Program. There's two of them. The power manager installs switches on the outdoor units of air conditioners, and we control the air conditioner during peak times during the summer. The Energy Wise Home allows people to use their thermostats and enroll in a program. Both of these programs will put a credit on the bill for participation. Next slide. So uh, residential programs that require some upfront capital. One is our residential new construction. This is only in DEP. It's an incentive. It um, goes to the builder and the builder can pass it along to the buyer, but it's basically aimed at the builder to get them to meet or exceed the um, North Carolina high, high efficiency residential option standards called the HERO standards. Even though it's based on the North Carolina standard, we do the same thing in South Carolina so that builders in South Carolina can get as good as And that's actually a higher, it's that North, and North Carolina high efficiency residential option is higher than the South Carolina yeah. standard. So there's actually more savings in those South Carolina homes. Yeah. And then our energy efficient appliances and devices, this is kind of an umbrella term for our online store and our retail point of sale outlets where we sell a number of energy efficient 
measures at um, a reduced price and we pay the incentive directly to the retailer or we reduce the price on the online store so the customer just gets things cheaper. And then our residential smart saver where we um, incentivize HVAC, ducts, replacement, water heaters, pool pumps. We use a trade ally network and a referral system called Find It Duke. Um, find It Duke has been very successful. It's an easy way for customers to call in and find our trade allies. We give them three to choose from. And our last um, survey, customers gave it a 4.75 satisfaction rating out of five. So we're, we're happy with that. We've seen it steadily increase as the longer we've had it. So, and that, that modification and is really unique to Duke, and it's really what helps keep the program cost effective. Yeah, so those trade allies pay us a referral fee, and then we take that referral fee and apply it to the program cost, so we um, reduce our program cost with those referral fees. So it's really a symbiotic relationship. Our non-residential programs, um, the Small Business Energy Saver, which is very similar to what Therese described for their small business direct install. Um, our Smart Saver Prescriptive, we have um, yeah, a number of measures. This is a, an all-encompassing program, really. Anything that we can hit, that we know works, we will put in prescriptive. If we don't know if it works, and we or if it's unique to a customer, requires a little more research, then we put it in Smart Saver Custom. And any cost-effective project, if we can figure out a way to make it work, we will make it work. Um, we have the performance incentive where we E and V over time to see what the, uh, the actual results are. Energy assessments where we do a virtual assessment of a building in order to get the, um, in order to get the, uh, the project to work. Um, or to, to help the owner to figure out what project will work and design assistance. Design assistance has been especially um, interesting here lately because it includes some manufactured low income housing design assistance so we can help folks who are building or renovating, refinancing low income housing to make, to become eligible for some tax credits that are from the federal government. So if we combine those assessments with our design assistance, we can help them to get more money available. We also have combined heat and power, which is part of our Smart Saver prescriptive, um, or Smart Saver custom, because it's tailored to the customer that needs it. Um, all of these non-residential programs are, are designed to be more attractive and beneficial to our commercial and industrial customers so that they will choose not to opt out. And just as in Dominion, in our service territories, commercial, all industrial customers and commercial customers that use more than a million kilowatt hours a year have the option to opt out of the energy efficiency programs and demand, and demand time management programs and not pay into the rider. But we try to make our programs um, attractive and helpful and tailored to their needs so that we can motivate them to stay in the program. The last two um, on this slide are demand response, the energy wise for business and power share um, that gives customers credits for curtailing their load and then demand response automation gives customers credit for letting us control their electric load. The next slide please. So we work with a large and active, engaged, collaborative group across North and South Carolina, has folks from um, low-income groups, environmental groups, um, universities, uh, regulators, uh, all interested stakeholders, really, and they help us to spot gaps in our programs. They bring us new ideas, and we've been working with them on a number of things, three of which you see right here. One is a new way of doing income qualified programs. We have a three year pilot approved in North Carolina. It's got a year under its belt. So far it's doing pretty well. Where instead of paying the community action agencies um, per measure based on what they install, we're doing EM and V and paying them based on the savings per kilowatt hour. So pay for performance model um, is more cost effective than our current low income programs and we have high hopes for it. But we are studying it over three years and we're only a third of the way in. The second piece is our non-residential upstream 
we've had a midstream channel where we pay um, in our prescriptive program, we'll pay discount, instead of paying it directly to the customer, we'll pay it to the distributor. But we found that there are some manufacturers that don't use a distributor. So we're looking at the possibility of going upstream and paying rebates directly to manufacturers to offer cheaper, um, or I should say less expensive equipment to new customers. And then the last thing is our Small Business Energy Saver program has been wildly successful, um, but we've seen that it started to taper off. We may have, we may have collected some of the low-hanging fruit. We're going to see if we can expand that model by offering our incentives, pairing them with third-party financing, and giving it to more than just small businesses. This is in its very early development. We're not sure exactly how this will work yet. Um, this money will not be coming from Duke. Duke will just be making the introduction and helping to streamline the process. So we're still working on that. I think the, um, the lesson here from these programs in development is that when we have a well-crafted incentive mechanism, we are motivated to achieve all available cost-effective savings that we can achieve. And it's worked because we are proud to be the leader in the Southeast um, in energy efficiency savings. The uh, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy has called us out for the last two years as being you know, way ahead of the pack in our region. Um, and that's in no small part, as Tim mentioned at the very beginning, to the favorable regulatory environment. Oh, I think we lost Linda, but I think she was wrapping up. So thank you to Tim and Linda. Um, that was uh, that was great. And I'm going to move us along um, to Santi Cooper. Um, Jim, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? I can. Go ahead. Very good. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate that, Jim. Good morning, everyone. And first slides, basically, uh, I appreciate the, the two earlier um, presentations and sounds like we're kind of in line with the IOUs and um, there's a couple of highlights on this slide here if you're not familiar with Sandy Cooper and public power we are one of the larger there's about 2,000 there's over 2,000 public power utilities in the US and we're one of the larger ones and our safety reliability and customer service are, are, are among the top of all of those so um, let's next slide please Just like the IOUs, we began uh, around 2008, 2009 is when we first started uh, gathering or, or count, counting and all of our energy efficiency savings. And we began with a baseline assessment and a market potential study to see what was what energy savings were possible within our service territory. First four years of the program, we were not successful. We were not meeting our targets, but it's like a locomotive. We continue to push hard and press until finally we got it moving. And then once it started moving, things really began to flourish. Over the 10 year period that you see there, we served over 77,000 customers and um, saved our customers about $258 million over the life of the improvements to their homes, businesses. The, um, we do the same thing as others. We do the third party Cadmus EM and V just to have a third party verification, just to make sure that what we say that we have saved our customers, we have. In fact, the Cadmus came back and said that um, we could claim additional savings if we chose to do so, that we were very conservative with our savings. But the way we do our, um, I'll, I'll just touch on it for a second. We basically, our program development, well, I'll get to that later. Let me go back to, to the next thing. Let's go on to slide three, please. Looking at the quick way of, of showing everyone how what Sandy Cooper energy efficiency programs are out there currently, I just went to our website and you can go to www.sandycooper.com and you can see the blow up in the middle there of the actual save energy and money section. And um, so basically if we go there and this is, so we got it segmented into for my home, for my business, you can look at the rebate specifically, you can see our trade ally network you can see our loan program, get information on that. And of course we have solar and green power and then everyone can come and get energy savings tips. Next slide, please. 
So for focus, um, if you were to click on the For My Home, this is the slide on the left. It will show you all the rebate options that you have, the opportunities there. Obviously, we have heat pumps, smart thermostats, duct replacements, heat pump water heaters, pool equipment, and Energy Star appliances are available. And so if we were to click on the heat pump and say learn more, the second slide over or the picture on the right would jump up, pop up, and you can see that we have rebates from $200 to $400 on heat pumps. And of course, um, mini splits, it's like $40 to $80 per ton, depending on the SEER rating that you were to choose. Then at the bottom is what we call our house call kits. We actually go and um, we do free energy audits for our customers. Anytime they call, we'll go in and help them see where they can save energy. And uh, these are the energy doctors, that's Amanda, Isaac, and Ferris uh, that you see on the screen. And those guys do a great job. I actually attended one of the energy audits with uh, Amanda, we walked in and within minutes she had diagnosed that they had an HVAC problem. So it was very, uh, it's great to see folks who know what they're doing at work and it was wonderful. But the home energy kits will leave uh, customers and this has been a, a big hit with some of our low income customers through HUD agencies and things like that. Or we'll help them with some uh, pipe wrap or uh, window stripping and of course LEDs. LEDs are the big hit. And we can become two within the energy kit, and we'll also give an additional up to 12 if a customer asks for them. Next slide, please. So now if we look at the business side of it, um, so these are the rebates that you would see for your re um, businesses. Uh, lighting has always and continues to be one of our um, heavy hitters, if you will. But we have other things like lighting controls, underwater LED lighting, HVAC improvements, uh, refrigeration and kitchen equipment, hot water, and of course pumps and motors. Around Myrtle Beach, there are a lot of lazy rivers, so we've um, changed out a lot of the pumps and motors to more efficient ones and saved a lot of money for our customers. Again, just like before on the residential side, if you were to click on the Learn More for retrofitting lighting, you can see more of the information, details about what a customer can do, and also select the trade ally to get some bids on getting it reduced. You don't have to be a trade ally to change out your lighting or to in make the improvements. Uh, you get a better rebate if you do. But um, So that's one of those things. And all, of course, all of our websites have frequently asked questions as well. Next slide, please. Another one of our more popular programs is our loan program. We've been loaning our customers for energy efficiency improvements since 1982. And um, we also enhanced it in 2008 with a re renewable energy loan program. Currently, our interest rate is 2.75%, and we base it on the prime. We'll always go 2% below whatever the prime interest rate is. So it's very attractive, and a lot of our customers take advantage of it. In fact, um, we've loaned, since 1982, we've loaned almost $56 million to our customers. And of course, their payback is through their own bill financing option. They can just put it in with their bill, and that's been going on since 1982. And then um, we've also served over 9,000 customers during that time. So it's been a very uh, effective program, and it helps customers get their energy efficiency uh, needs accomplished, if you will. Next slide, please. That's pretty much where we've been and what we're doing currently, but you know, this is kind of the stepping stones to the future. If you look at our 2020 plan, we were successful, and I didn't point it out, but we actually completed that program two full years ahead of schedule because of the you know, great work of our team that they, they, they put into it. And so um, once that was done, we've been shifting gears, getting ready for our 2030 program. And since uh, energy efficiency for our residential and commercial customers were so effective, we're definitely going to include that in our 2030 plan. We'll continue to help save our customers energy and money. And um, so that'll be the, you know, the, the base block, if you will, the building block that we'll springboard from. We also, like the um, Dominion and Duke has done, or they already have those guys in place, we, have, we began with a small business energy saver program. We went from pilot program last year to full throttle, and it has been, we've, we've received the same success that those guys are talking about. It's been extremely successful. Customers love it. It really helps them out, and um, we're glad to do that for sure. 
And then we're also going to expand into some demand response programs, you know, looking at some of the heavier energy consuming devices within the home and businesses and help try to manage our demand during those peak times. We'll also look, we're looking at some critical peak pricing opportunities as well. If those um, come out, if, if we actually are able to implement those. And then we're also looking at some beneficial electrification, of course, electric vehicles. We want to be able to plan for the future and look for those to come so that they don't impact the grid from its operational op um, the way it should work. We don't want to do anything that's going to negatively impact it. So like charging habits and things of that nature. We've, we've been working on that for a few years now and, and are starting to buy electric vehicles as our fleet. We're going to try to buy 60 over the next 10 years and also help our municipalities and other agencies that's in our service territory also in, uh, purchase electric vehicles. The um, so all of that is going to be flavored with a heavy dose of excellent customer service, which Sandy Cooper is known for. So next slide, please. One of the questions that we were asked is how to actually, um, you know, how does Sandy Cooper do their, uh, develop a program. So a quick little example from the customer's perspective. If a customer were buying a light bulb, they were trying to figure out, well, do I buy an incandescent or an LED? And they would have two options. From the customer's perspective, the incandescent is a lot cheaper than the LED. It costs more money. So cost is one of the, the factors, limiting factors. From the utility standpoint, you know, it's going to take more fuel to supply the incandescent light versus the LED light. So that's a consideration for us. And then from the customer standpoint, you know, it's going to cost a lot more money if he has an incandescent light installed versus the LED. So long term, he would be better off with the LED. And then we look at the operational lifetime expectancy of the bulb. So 1,000 hours versus 25,000 hours. So at that point, you know, still the customer still is undecided as to what they will do. So if there's some way that we as a utility can step up and rebate and make the initial cost cheaper, less, and that's what we do. And then once we do that, we get the benefit of um, having to purchase less fuel for the next um, slide. There you go. So we have less, less fuel that we need to buy. And the way we've done it, we've always, very similar to the way Tim explained it with Duke, we basically put in all of our cost factors of developing the programs, um, supporting the programs, the cost of the rebates, and then we compare that with the cost of developing one kilowatt hour at the generating station. So basically that's really the fuel cost. And if we can devise a program that's gonna be cheaper than the fuel cost coming out of our generating plants or what we can purchase off the market, then it's a viable program that we're willing to implement. And to me, it's really a win-win-win situation for everyone uh, when it's all said and done. We can see that in the next slide, please. So looking at it from the company standpoint, you can look at, there's some uh, opportunities for developing a program that's just not technically feasible. You can go ahead and press next, please. So for instance, we could develop a robot that could go around every room after you leave it and flip the switches off and you know, turn off all the lights when you leave a room and do things like that. And that's just not technically feasible to make it happen. So we've got to ignore that one. So you can see that uh, that's where I was getting to. If the power and the fuel savings are better or, or greater than the cost of the program, it's a really a good program. And if the cost and the fuel savings are less than the cost of the program, then it's not a good program and we won't move forward with it. Well, we, we can, as long as our entire portfolio is balanced, if you will. We have some programs that are right on the edge of the, where it's equal, and we'll supplement it with some of the other programs. A lot of times you have market barriers, like for instance, there's legislation. Um, sometimes they'll do income tax credits for solar. Those help enable a program to work more effectively. Sometimes you have customers who are represented by the grumpy cat, if you will, that it doesn't matter, I love my incandescent light, don't give me the squirrely cues and don't give me the LEDs. So those are the kind of uh, market barriers that you can have to overcome as well. You have to convince some folks that this is a better alternative. 
And then, of course, you got budget and resource constraints. If, if you don't have the budget to do it, it's not cost effective, and you don't have the budget to do it, or you don't have the resources, you don't have enough manpower to implement a program, then if you need 50 people and you only have 25, then that's not going to be a program that we can jump on. So then at the end of the day, the programs that we implement are cost effective and have been very successful in the, in, in the past. And like I said before, it's a win-win situation. It's a win for the customers because they're paying less money for their energy, uh, helps them with their family budgets and the cash flows of the businesses. It's a win for Santee Cooper because we were able to do it without ever generating that energy for those programs that we save the energy on. And of course, it's great uh, for win for our future generations because that energy, that fuel is still available for future generations to generate their power needs in the future. Next slide, please. And I'll wrap up with the questions. I, I saw a few of them that came through and I'll try to be brief about them. The first one that was on there was about uh, being able to help school districts with limited resources. We did have a we, we serve a school district in our service territory and they recently implemented three solar schools and they did receive our rebates uh, like uh, so they were they were minor compared to the full cost we will rebate up to six kw so i think they got eleven thousand dollars and for most of the schools for each one of them so that's really not a lot the, the biggest majority of the cost was borne by the taxpayers within that school district so that's kind of where those type things stand at this point. The, another question that came, are they being, are our energy efficiency programs being phased out? No, and I think you've heard from the other utilities as well. We're continuing, it's gonna be a building block for St. E. Cooper to springboard into the 2030 plan. So energy efficiency is still alive and well. Obviously we've chosen, we already picked the low hanging fruit that's available out there. And so it's gonna cost a little bit more money, but we are still, Energy efficiency is still a, a kingpin for us. The, um, do we have any financing opportunities? And I mentioned our finance, our loan program since 1982, so that's been very effective. Let's see, the next question was, time of use rates. Uh, we already have a time of use rate. Not too many people take advantage of it and but we're looking at the critical peak pricing, as I mentioned before. The current programs, and also tell us about the number of homes affected by these. So last year, just looking at last year, I should have put a slide up there, I should answer all of this, but basically in 2019, we served 1,745 individual homes with our existing homes program. And some of the homes implemented multiple measures. So we actually had 1,984 projects for the existing homes. Our new homes program were 415 that chose to, to, to go with the you know, all electric and that type of program. And then, let's see. So since 2009, we've had over 80,000 projects, which is great. That helps us with our customer satisfaction with over 80,000 customers participating in our energy efficiency programs. LED for commercial and HVAC are still our most popular programs. We do have a little bit of low income things going on. Like I mentioned before, the house call kit, free LEDs and free energy audits, we do those. And we're looking at another program for our low income, but we haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. So there, there are some opportunities there. And I think that's it. I will turn it back over to Jen. Great, thanks so much, Jim. And uh, any presentation that, that we used Grumpy Cat into it is good in my book, so thank you for that. Um, so, next you. We're gonna, <laughs> so next we're gonna go to the electric cooperatives with Mike Smith. Take it away, Mike. Thank you, Jen. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, my slides are really built around a, a subset of the programs that the cooperatives have going, have going on that help my house program. But um, if you'll advance to the next slide, uh, I'll acknowledge kind of how we're set up because uh, I realize that it's kind of important, you know, some of our differences and how, how we're governed and, uh, and it also in, uh, influences on how we choose our programs. And so uh, both Stacy and Catherine covered 
the differences of the co-ops in, in South Carolina. I was glad to see that we have over 800,000 customer members now. I can uh, revise my number up. But I want to acknowledge that you know 800,000 members really is one and a half million people. And so you know those are the people that we end up serving in the state. And as was acknowledged before or noted before, you know, there are 20 distribution cooperatives. And uh, here you can see on the map that they're located around the state. <clears throat> Central Electric is the generation and power provider for those cooperatives. And so all 20 purchase power from Central Electric. I work for the Association of Cooperatives uh, called Your Electric Cooper the Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina. Um, if you go to the next slide, I mean, not the next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, Central Electric purchases its energy, about a quarter of it from Duke Energy and 75% uh, from Santee Cooper. And so they provide all of our power and energy services uh, for the most part. Uh, really on this presentation, you know, talking big picture, uh, I should have either Scott Hammond or Cole Price on from Central Electric. Because if there is a program that touches all cooperatives, it is done out. It is done through Central. They're the ones that you know have the billion dollar charges to the cooperatives for their uh, energy purchases. Uh, and so you know, they have a few programs in place now, and I'll, I'll touch on them, that uh, each individual cooperative can choose to pick up or not. And one of them is a water heater load control program that's in place since the early 90s. Uh, a dual fuel heat program, for those of you who don't know it, uh, basically you have a, a heat pump, an electric heat pump, but when it gets really cold out, it goes over to either natural gas or propane. So that really helps our demand savings, you know, helping us to avoid uh, purchasing or purchasing more power or having to build generation. They have a smart thermostat program, you know, with the Nest, Nest and the Ecobee uh, thermostats out there now. We can control uh, that load through, you know, the Wi-Fi of the home. Uh, also, electric vehicle charging program, a generator program uh, for outages and a B2P program. And the B2P program is a, a voluntary program. And just as an example using this one, you know, of the 800,000 members, you know, 35,000 voluntarily raised their hand and 18 cooperatives that have chosen to move forward with this program to, you know, either through a text message, an email, uh, however you want to get the message, you know, is that you voluntarily reduce your energy use during a time that we call for. In the summer, it's in the you know, evening, afternoon, and in the wintertime, it's in the morning. And so, um, but right now, I'll, I'll leave that. And but say, as it turns out, every cooperative, distribution cooperative chooses whether to take a program that's done through Central or statewide for the marketing pieces. And um, and then they individually create their own programs when something is not offered at the at the higher level. So uh, you know, really to talk about what is offered each cooperative, you almost have to have each cooperative on this call. Next. Uh, so just an acknowledgement that 24% of our membership lives in manufactured homes. I think the average for the state is around 18 or 19%. We're a little bit higher. Some cooperatives are at 50%. Next. Uh, we all know about energy burden um, and how some of our cooperatives have the really high electric bills, especially double wide manufactured homes and the high, Help My House program, which I'll, I'll touch on here uh, to answer some of the questions that were asked, uh, addresses one of these uh, barriers that we have to our membership to getting access to high quality uh, contractor work improvements on their homes uh, without necessarily having good credit scores, especially on the low and moderate income. Next. And so uh, you can go to the next slide. So in 2011, and I'm going to use this program because a lot of uh, the energy efficiency programs we've talked about, the demand reduction programs we've talked about, are in addition to us really serving our members through large-scale generation, and it's, uh, I won't say it's a drop in the bucket. It, it's its notable, but it's not its not really going to help us at scale uh, 
and I can probably hear arguments from some of the IOUs on this, to, to reduce our need for new generation if our load does grow. But back in 2001, we did look at the possibility, the co-ops did as a group, of doing energy efficiency at a high level to see if we could avoid generation. And so that was part of our pilot program. I, many of you are familiar with it, so I'll just say briefly, uh, we weatherized 125 homes looking to see if we could uh, prove a concept that we could take to maybe a third of our membership to reduce their energy use and their demand to meet our growth and avoid having to build new generation. Next. And so the questions we asked, you know, going into that pilot program is, can energy efficiency be, be a generation resource, not just a member service? Next. Can we intentionally target homes, accurately, mo accurately model the energy savings, and then effectively make the changes in those homes to reduce the energy use? Next. Uh, will our members be satisfied with a program that's really behind the meter? And, and is everybody who runs a behind the meter program where you're going into members' homes and businesses, uh, it can be tricky to do it well. And I was happy to hear, I think it was um, Dominion say that, oh no, it was um, Linda over at Duke say that their member satisfaction has gone up with their programs. It's not always an easy thing to do is to achieve um, improved member satisfaction. Next. And the last question is, can, uh, can we have the member pay for these improvements, not have it be a giveaway program that either the uh, other non-participating rate payers or, or members have to pay, or in the case of IOUs, the uh, shareholders? And so uh, this is a program that the member actually pays for the work. We just manage the program. And then they pay for it over 10 years. Next. And so uh, the program that we're running now was made possible by a 2010 law that gives us cutoff rights. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. If you'll go to the next slide, in the interest of time. Uh, we did big, big improvements on the homes, uh, usually spending anywhere between $7,500 to $10,000 on a home, universally replacing the heat pumps, and then sealing up everything else to get the energy savings. Next. And what we learned from this pilot program was that it is possible to run a weatherization program, have the members pay for the improvements with the energy savings. And so in the case of our Help My House pilot, it is, it is uh, important to note that the loan repayment in the case of these 125 homes averaged at $869 a year. The modeled energy savings and the realized energy savings within 1% was $1,157. And so this was important because that means we could run a program that our members pay for, but the energy savings more than cover the cost of the members. So now we can include low and moderate income members. Um, without financial risk to them. And we can uh, and have them pay for the program without an undue burden to non-participating members who either their homes didn't qualify or they chose not to participate in the program. And I know running in a utility program, it's really a tricky balance to manage that tension between uh, those who are receiving the benefit of a, a energy efficiency or demand side management program financially, and then those who aren't exercising on that program, but are having to pick up the cost. Next. And so what we learned from that little program is we reduced energy savings by more than 30%. Uh, I touched on the savings. And, uh, and then the homes were more comfortable to live in and we met our customer satisfaction expectations. Next. So this is one of the questions that was asked uh, in the last week. Where have energy efficiency programs been used to reduce or supplement, supplant peak demand? And of course, if you're gonna avoid building new generation in a program, then you have to address that question. And so next, <clears throat> what we learned from our 125 home pilot 
is the answer. And we did not intentionally reduce the demand. What we did is we just made the homes more efficient. But what we learned in the average summer days, if you look at the dark shaded area, that was the energy use of the home by hour, you know, from midnight to midnight. And as you can see, the energy use goes higher in the evening. Uh, it peaked at over five kilowatts uh, on a peak summer day. After the improvements on the home, the peak was more like three and a half kilowatts. And so the demand savings we learned during the summertime was about 24% of, of the post and pre homes, whereas the energy savings was more like 33%. If you advance, but in the wintertime, our demand savings were even greater, over 40%. So our energy savings, again, was around 33% on the year. But in the wintertime, when our system truly peaks, uh, we went from over 5 kW on our peak hour to a little less than 3 kW. And so, and we weren't trying, we weren't adding additional equipment to reduce the demand. Next. And so when, so for the co-offset of, and we have had a few co-offs that have continued the program since, um, since the pilot program, we are installing additional devices to get additional demand savings. It includes the Ecobee thermostat uh, to control and participate in the centrally run program um, to reduce peak. And we've seen savings of anywhere between one to almost two kW, depending on the, the month and the peak which is significant, and we're still installing water heater controls, but smarter ones, ones that actually measure the uh, temperature of the tank and can calculate how much energy needs can be filled back in the tank, which is kind of preparing us for the future when we bring on solar, and we may have times of excess generation that we need to fill our tanks with cheap solar energy, uh, so allow us to run our grid better. Next. So uh, the next question is, in addition to telling us about the current utility programs, could you tell us about the number of homes affected by each and how about low income and low to moderate income households? Next. So one thing I can say about our program is we don't do credit checks, and, but I, I know we have low and moderate income uh, homes in our program because some of the homes have been previous, what, previously weatherized by community action agencies, and we went in and made some tweaks and then maybe added a, a new piece of equipment included them in our home. So um, I'll just say programs can be designed to include low and moderate income, but it is a challenge. Next. This is just the current status of our programs. We actually were over 800 homes now that we've included in this uh, weatherization. And I'm gonna go through quickly uh, the next few slides in the interest of time. Next. There is a, uh, go to the next slide, please. I'll just, uh, I want to give a shout out to the Rural Energy Savings Programs because it's available to co-ops and to munis. The smaller munis uh, could, could take part in this around the state. But uh, we use the program. We have over $15 million available to us. And, and we're able, because of this, to uh, borrow money at 0% over 10 years and then relend it to our members. And currently, we're relending it at 3 and 3 quarters percent to 5%. Next. The, uh, this was a question that was asked. Um, this was a question that was asked, you know, can we do more than just whole house energy retrofits to include battery storage and beneficial electrification uh, measures? Go on to the next slide. And I'll just say that this, this money that we have tapped into at the uh, DOE level, uh, not, I mean, at the uh, USDA level, actually allows you to borrow money for not just building envelope upgrades, but lighting upgrades, energy storage, on off renewable energy systems, read that as solar here in South Carolina, and to include replacing uh, manufactured homes in their entirety. And there's like the $100 million currently available coming up in the next uh, swath of money. And so I think uh, the next slide, please. Just get these next two questions and, and I'm pretty much done in the interest of time and we can you know answer at the end here uh, any of the uh, I think very interestingly asked questions about you know, how do we uh, justify solar or get solar into like low and moderate income homes thank you
Wonderful. Thanks, Mike. And there were a few questions that came in about Help My House, but I'm going to save those until after our last uh, presenter. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, next up is Eric Buzz from um, the Municipal Association of South Carolina. Welcome, Eric. Good morning. I'm Eric Buzz. I'm Deputy Executive Director of the Municipal Association and provide management support to the South Carolina Association of Municipal Power Systems. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on providing a background on the municipal elect, um, electric utilities and the unique characteristics that exist within those uh, utilities. Next slide, please. So there are 21 municipal electric utilities that operate in South Carolina, and some of those are among the uh, oldest systems in the state, actually dating back to the 1890s. The majority of the municipal electric systems were established between the 1890s and the 1930s. Next slide. Unlike the co-ops, the uh, municipal um, electric utilities have no central generation or transmission agency. So SCAMPS is actually a um, confederation of, of the 21 independent uh, utilities. The majority of, of the municipal electric systems are located north and west as Columbia is represented on this map. Um, with three utilities located uh, in the coastal plain. The largest municipal electric utilities are Rock Hill, Orangeburg Department of Public Utilities, Greer CPW, Easily Combined Utilities, and Greenwood CPW, with the clustering of those larger systems primarily in the upstate. Uh, next slide. The uh, legal authority uh, is established for municipalities being the electric business, both by the Constitution, which allows us to operate the systems, but also the right to control the use of the roads and streets within the municipal boundaries. Uh, next slide. And then statutes that specifically authorize it, the municipal general power provision of 5760, and then the municipal utilities, to a limited extent, are subject to the same uh, laws as the co-ops and investor owns that are found in Title 58, Public Utilities, Chapter 27, uh, governing electric utilities and electric co-ops. Next slide. What's unique about the municipal electric utilities is that we have no rights under the Territorial Assignment Act. So service territory of the municipal electric utilities is generally limited to customers within the incorporated boundaries of the, of the municipalities. And as those boundaries grow through annexation, the municipal electric utility has the right to serve new premises in the annexed area and also premises in unassigned territories. Next slide. Again, a unique characteristic of the municipal electric utilities is they're governed by municipal elected officials. So of the 21 municipal electric utilities in the state, 14 of those municipal electric utilities are governed by a city council or town council. And seven of the utilities are governed by a separate commission or board of public works elected by the residents within the municipality. Uh, the elected council as the governing board is responsible for establishing the policy, setting rates, providing broad oversight of the operations, and hiring the management staff. Uh, next slide. So collectively, the municipal electric utilities serve approximately 100, 170,000 customers. As I said earlier, Rock Hill is the largest with approximately 34,000 customers. And the smallest is due west with approximately 435 customers. All of the municipal electric utilities operate exclusively as electric distribution systems. Uh, none of them own significant generation assets, um, but they do have um, some peak shaving generation. Next slide. Again, a unique characteristic, and in, in unlike the co-ops that have the central generation and transmission function, each of the 21 municipal power systems purchase wholesale power by independently by long-term contracts. Uh, currently, the wholesale power suppliers to the 21 municipal electric utilities include 
Piedmont Municipal Power Agency, which is a municipal joint action agency established by the state legislature. It serves 10 of the municipal electric utilities, primarily in the upstate. NTE Carolinas serves three systems, Dominion Energy 2, Duke Energy Carolinas 2, Santee Cooper directly to, and then Santee Cooper through distribution co-ops in additional to municipal electric utilities. Because of the uh, um, take or pay or all requirements nature of, of these wholesale power contracts, the municipal electric utilities generation portfolio really mirrors that of the wholesale supplier. And there's very little opportunity during the life of the contract for the utility to add additional generation resources outside of the contract. Next slide. Most of the municipal electric utilities also have SEPA allocations, uh, hydro uh, generation um, that supplements uh, the supply. Next slide. So SCAMPS is, is a nonprofit corporation created to foster cooperation among the municipal electric utilities primarily in the area of emergency mutual aid, education and training, shared legal services, and legislative advocacy. We have no regulatory authority over the 21 uh, municipal electric utilities. Next slide. Next slide. So with regard to the energy efficiency programs, they are operated uh, largely independently by each of the 21 municipal electric utilities. The one exception is the 10 um, municipalities that are supplied by Piedmont Municipal Power Agency, and those 10 uh, utilities do share energy efficiency programs to some extent that include um, education programs, and primarily load control switches on uh, HVAC and heat pumps. Um, but because of the independent nature of the systems, really a cost-benefit analysis has to be done by each utility. And because of the small size of about half of the municipal electric utilities, that does pose a uh, significant challenge. A uh, more detailed list of the programs that are operated by the municipal electric utilities are submitted to the energy office each year as part of their annual survey. Um, and I believe there are links that uh, go to the sites of the various independent uh, uh, utilities. And uh, that, that concludes the information I have, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Fantastic. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you to all of the speakers. Um, we do now have 20 minutes to answer questions, so um, I'm going to actually read them backwards because it seems easier that way. Um, the first question um, actually is for you, Eric, and I uh, wanted to know what, what PMTA, where PMTA gets its power from. Okay. Uh, Piedmont Municipal Power Agency, uh, those 10 members have a collective 25% interest in one of the Catawba nuclear plant units operated by Duke Energy. And so that is their primary source of wholesale power. They do have supplemental and backstand contracts with other uh, energy suppliers. Thank you. Um, the next one's for you, Mike. Actually, there were two that came in about the Help My House uh, pilot and program. Um, one was asking, um, why didn't you continue it? I think you did continue it. Maybe you can go a little bit more into um, what happened after the pilot. and then. Another question was, um, did it move away from a loan program to an on-bill tariff program? Okay, so uh, after, so when we first ran the pilot, it was a central po program, and it was all 20 cooperatives participating, only, even though we only did work in eight cooperatives. But like I say, it was a pilot and a test, just a you know, proof of concept. After we finished with that, uh, a couple co-ops decided, you know, they really liked the program, they liked the service it gave to their members. And, and at that time, it shifted between a generation resource program where it was really important to get the energy and demand savings and to be able to count on it and the persistency of it to a member service program. 
And that was Aiken and then uh, Santee continued the program and then a couple other co-ops too. And so that's been almost eight years ago. And now uh, I think there's a total of eight co-ops that have signed up for this rest funding, this $15.5 million. And, um, and we're in the middle of kind of revamping our program to, you know, spend that money out. And hopefully, you know, $15 million, $15.5 million will touch about 1,600 homes. And it's still, if, if you think of the scale of things, you know, 800,000 members, 1,600 homes, it's something, but it's not going to help us avoid building new generation. So really, it's just a member service. But we're, it's still important to get the savings for the members we have so we can include the low and moderate income and um, in this program. A lot of the homes that we touch, the HVAC unit may not have been working uh, for a year or two. And so people added window units and have been heating with strip heating. And so uh, you know, this gives us a, something that we can offer our members where they actually get in a, a, a healthier, safer place where they're more in control of the energy use. What was the second question? Yeah, the second question was, did it move from a, a loan program to an unbuilt tariff program, or did some of the some no, of the co-ops? No, we still use the 2010 statute for on-bill financing, and so uh, and that means that when we it's it's a it's a it's a burden attached to the meter service, and so uh, we actually file a document and notice the meter conservation charge in the county that the uh, member resides in, that the home resides in, and they do need to own the home or the person that owns the property in the home needs to sign on for the uh, this also, this loan. But it can transfer when a property is sold or in a landlord-tenant situation, it can transfer between uh, tenants. Thanks, Mike. The next one's for you, but I think you might um, just tell us yes or no. Um, are Central's programs offered um, to the, the are the programs that Central offers to the cooperatives, are they listed anywhere publicly? Is there a place that people can go to see them? Probably the best place to, to look is on the uh, South Carolina Energy Office. Uh, puts out a report annually that talks about some of the programs. But you know, there, there's some missing in there because, well, the Central should be in there. But the, the ones that are additionally offered at each cooperative, uh, you know, you'd have to go to each cooperative to, to see what they offer. Great, also, thank this you. Is Stacey. Um, we also have our one-pagers um, on our website that have um, broken down by utility and what programs are offered there too, so that's another option. And Central has it on our website as well. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks. Um, the next one, I, and there were a couple questions about this. This is for Dominion um, related to the home energy check up tier two. Um, how many homes per year will Dominion weatherize those tier two measures and um, will it, those measures include duct sealing? Um, so, hey, this is Cheryl. I don't think I spoke earlier. Um, so, in we just completed the potential study, got approval for the program, and so the tier two measures, we have a list of cost effective measures and we'll be targeting the ones that are at the top of that list. I will say that it is highly likely that duct sealing is going to be included in that list of measures. And then I wanted to add, add additionally, tier one, we're starting to do direct install of more measures, but it ranges, that list ranges anything from um, faucet aerators to shower heads to air sealing, wall insulation, duct insulation, and duct sealing. All of those are potential measures in that. Oh, and the number of homes, I'm sorry. We hope in the first year, this will be our first year, we hope to complete between 300 to 350. Great, and there was another question that was kind of along the same lines of who does the rebate go to? It's always the homeowner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so the next question is a general question for everyone, and I'll just throw it out there, um, whoever wants to answer it. Um, what sector or general building type, um, for example, new residential, older residents, small business, industrial, is the largest energy wasting or least efficient group of your customers? And what can a state organization be, mo be most helpful in making buildings more energy efficient? Is there something a state organization can do that you cannot, or can a state organization um, bolster what you're already doing. 
I, this is Tim from Duke. I think that's a tough question. I think if you look at an aggregate group of, of residential customers, you might go at aged manufactured housing as being a very highly inefficient market that could be could be better served, but there's also some limits on what you can do with those houses. The, I think from a commercial and industrial, a lot of it may not necessarily be building focused. Um, a lot of the opportunity is in process and the equipment utilized by those industrial customers. So I, I don't know if there's a specific uh, commercial building type that would really be something you could target because it really does depend on what a lot of the energy usage really depends on what that customer is doing with respect to the opportunity to save efficient uh, through efficiency. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Anybody else? Well, I, I can just say I, I would I would second everything that Tim said, but I would say that our programs, you know, we have a large industrial group that's opted out, so they certainly those industrial customers use a lot of energy, so that would probably be the largest area. But they are for business reasons that makes sense for them to do that outside of our program. But our programs are designed to um, specifically target existing customers' homes versus new construction. There's a lot of opportunity with duct work that we see out in the field with our customers. So I would say existing homes, mobile homes, low-income customers uh, in older rental homes that they can't, um, you know, they don't own the, the uh, building that they live in, but there's a lot of opportunity there on the residential side. And then for the C&I customers, you know, there's a big need for our small business customers. Um, they can't opt out of our programs, but they also don't have energy managers. So though our programs are designed to look at, at existing customers, low-income customers, and hopefully benefit the largest amount of small businesses that we can assist. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. And um, so the second part of that question I'd be interested in hearing um, your thoughts on, too, is, um, you know, can a, a state organization or some outside organization assist you with bolstering these programs um, in any way? I certainly think that the education that the Energy Office has provided and sharing, th this meeting right here is very helpful so that everyone knows what's going on. Um, and is educated about the existing programs that we have. Code enforcement around duct work or HVAC, um, HVAC installation, assuming that manual J's are performed correctly, seems like a, a good fit for um, the energy office versus the individual utilities, because that does impact everyone in the state when you're talking about residential customers. That's some of my thoughts or our thoughts. This is Mike Smith. I kind of agree with what everybody said. Uh, on the uh, manufactured home, the older ones, you know, we don't like to include homes over 25 years old. And so that, that leaves out a lot of uh, homes that are out there that will probably continue to be out there for another 15 or 20 years. And so um, that that's a real challenge. As far as agencies helping, I think a, a cha an opportunity or a challenge we have going forward is starting to tie in some of the health issues that happen in some of these homes that are uh, poorly sealed or unhealthy and kind of getting help to understand the scope of the, the health issues and then being able to tie in possible funding from other sources to you know improve the health and then Im improve the homes together so then we end up winning across the board but that that's a little tricky because it seems to really go down to for us almost you know every county individually um, and in you know, very close and personal relationships um, that, that vary quite right, uh, widely. But a state effort to uh, maybe understand the, the problem and the opportunity there with the health and safety savings with some of these upgrades on these older homes. Great. Yeah, and I, I, I absolutely agree with you, Mike. I think that's that's definitely something that should be tied in and we should look at. Um, 
That's all the questions I had online. I'm going to go back to a couple of questions that came in before the webinar. Some of you touched on, on these, but um, others might not have. One of them was um, about utilities implementing time of use rates as an energy efficiency measure. Um, I, and so, someone that didn't touch on that, can you talk a little bit about what your utility is doing? Sure, uh, this is Tim. You know, we've looked at time of use rates. Time of use rates really don't promote necessarily efficiency. It's really they promote sh shifting of of load um, because you're really trying to get that load away from peak times. But in gener generally, there isn't an assumed overall reduction. In fact, in some cases, you can actually see an increase um, in usage associated with TOUs because they're just sh doing pre-cooling and, and post-cooling around things. But um, I, I think one of the biggest concerns we've had with respect to TOUs is that uh, unless you make TOUs a default rate, generally the people that sign up for TOU rates are natural winners, meaning they don't, they're not making usage changes, they're just seeing the benefit of when their usage occurs. So if, if you're trying to get customers to not use during the, let's say, two to five o'clock window in the summer, uh, during that peak period, well, if somebody works remotely away from home and they're not using during that period anyway, if they shift to a TOU rate, they'll pay a lower, a lower bill, but there aren't any system savings because they haven't had to change their behavior. And so those natural winners from what we've seen from the TOU pilots we've run, they're the ones that generally sign up, so you're not necessarily seeing it. Um, so they really can struggle from a cost effectiveness standpoint um, versus some of the better load shifting programs that we currently offer where we have actual control over the device to cycle an air conditioner to make sure that you are seeing those peak reductions. This is Mike, and I, I agree with um, what Tim said. You know, I think an effective time of use, well, first off, all time of use rates are not the same, and so the failure of one doesn't mean that time of use is bad. It may just, may just be a bad design. Uh, everybody should be in, and you don't even have the opportunity to opt out. Uh, now, there may be special treatment for unique load shapes that have been lumped together in a rate class, but outside of that, uh, everybody should be on it. This should be designed to where everybody can be on it fairly. Um, the other piece is it may not be so bad to actually use a little bit more energy if we're using it at a different time. You know, it may be possible that we can increase our energy use but reduce our carbon footprint and our costs. Um, through a rate that encourages the right kind of behavior. But, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, we've all been programmed that, you know, we've got to reduce the use, got to, you know, you know, a, a positive program is one that reduces the energy use, but that isn't necessarily true depending on when you use it. I like that slogan, reduce the use. <laughs> there you Thanks, go. Thank Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be our energy I love that slogan as well. It's been very effective. <laughs> <laughs> all right, one final question for you all. Um, as energy efficiency programs have matured, there seems to be better to be more opportunities to better integrate programs into broader utility-wide strategies. For example, helping to defer capital infrastructure projects, address grid capacity constraints. How are the South Carolina utilities achieving some of these broader objectives with their energy efficiency programs? Uh, so I think it was kind of mentioned by Therese, but Duke, we work with our system planners um, and we're really starting to even look, at, we're doing something called in, integrated system operation planning, where we're starting to look down at a circuit level and see if there's anything we can do with respect to targeted marketing to get more participation in programs in a area of need with respect to T&D investment, uh, which is really kind of the best way from our vantage point to try and address those high cost areas. But um, since you're using a system average in your avoided cost calculations, you really make, it, it's just a further enhancement that allows you to, to try and get the benefits. But in addition to those load, to those Kind of T&D investments, uh, you know, our our IRP team for a number of years now has been working closely with us to understand 
what can be done from an energy efficiency standpoint, um, both from a low, medium, and high case standpoint, to truly try and look at and understand can energy efficiency defer or eliminate the need for a unit. The other thing it can do is potentially allow for earlier retirements. Um, and again, that's part of an integrated plan. But one of the things that is important to remember is with efficiency, unlike some other assets, you have to build it over time, kind of one kilowatt hour or one KW at a time. So it, it's gotta be something that you're committed to um, in the short term, even though there may not be a capacity need in the short term, to make sure that you're running those programs to get to deliver the savings when they're necessary to avoid a unit being built. Hey, this is Jim with Sandy Cooper. We are just getting to the point where we're exploring the demand response program, and we're doing some research. We've done some research, and we look like we're going to implement one. And our goal is kind of to look at it from a, if we can get 200 megawatts under manageable load where we can push a button and drop our, um, reduce the demand at that moment, it can prevent us from turning on another unit that will, and normally at startup on units with the uh, power utility, that's where you have, where you can uh, have some inefficiency, cranking one up, shutting it down, those are bad things to do, and they're very costly. So we're looking at that, so that's going to, and if that's very successful, then it will definitely impact the customers. It'll save on their bills, their overall cost. Great. Thank you both. Um, so just, um, we're going to be wrapping up. Any final words of wisdom that you all have for the listeners? I think you've shared enough. Thank you. Um, so I wanted... Well, thanks for allowing us to be on and share. This is really nice. Yeah, and, and thank you all for, for coming on and sharing and being a part of this. I know this was a long webinar, but I found it so informational, and um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you to everyone who listened in and just sent in questions. Um, and again, this will be recorded, so hopefully spread it around. Let's, let's, uh, let's share the education and awareness a little bit. Um, thank you all for joining, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.